Hey friend, are you planning to write a memoir this year? If so, I really want you to watch this video because after being an editor for 25 years, I can tell you there are some common mistakes that memoirists make and I want you to avoid them. So I'm gonna lay them out plus tips for how you can get around them in this video. My name is Kelly Notaris. I'm the founder of KN Literary Arts. We're your one-stop shop, getting you from wherever you are to having a book in your hand. So please visit us at knliterary.com. I'm also a book editor in the US publishing business, been doing this for 25 years, and I bring all of the wisdom that I've gained in that time to this YouTube channel for free. So please hit the subscribe button and that little bell icon so you never miss a video. Okay, today I am doing one of my favorite topics, memoir, because I have so many clients who want to tell their story, either to entertain people or to teach them something or some combination of both. And I find that each time I see somebody's pitch or a new manuscript, I notice that there are some very common mistakes that are showing up. And I want to make sure that you do not run into these mistakes. So I'm going to outline four common mistakes and I'm going to give you my pro tip for how you can avoid each one of them. So the first one that I see over and over is someone who is trying to fit in every important story in their life, every important person in their life. They're basically making a chronicle of their life. And while sometimes that can work, especially if you're a celebrity or someone who already has a really big following, you know, like right now, Britney Spears um, autobiography is on the New York Times bestseller list. And there's a reason for that. People know her, they're curious about her. They want to find out more about what her life has been like, but that's because she already has us <laughs> as her fans, right? So she's a celebrity in our minds. And there are people in your life for whom you are a celebrity. And sometimes there's reason to write your autobiography. For example, if you want to leave the legacy for your family, you want to tell the story so your grandkids and great grandkids will know who you were, then maybe you do want to be writing that legacy book. But if you're looking to write a memoir that you want people to read who don't know you, you really need to carve out an excellent story from the millions of great stories in your life. So that is the pro tip I have for you around not trying to cram everything in there. It's not like everything but the kitchen sink type thing. We want you to choose one story, one theme that has been resonant for you over the course of your life. And then of course, out of this telling of that particular story, you may end up going back in time. You may end up even going forward in time. You can bring in all the good stories that you want to include, but you have the whole thing in the context of one idea. And part of the reason for that, it's not just because it makes for a better read, but it's also that your reader is then going to know what this memoir is about. Too often when I ask people, well, what kind of memoir are you writing? They'll say, oh, well, first I had this problem in my adolescence, and then I moved on to this problem in my 20s, and then I overcame this problem later on, and then my kid had a problem, and I overcame that. And while you could say overcoming adversity is the theme there, I would love for you to pick something that's more niche, something that's more specific. And I'm going to give you some examples at the end of this video. Okay, so that's the first mistake, trying to cram everything in. The second mistake that I see so often, especially in new memoir writers, is that you are telling me what happened instead of showing me. So this is a distinction that is hugely important if you want people to read the book who haven't already known of you and gotten excited about your story, because you need to tell it in a way that is entertaining. <laughs> people come to memoir while they get kind of secondarily, oftentimes they'll learn something. They really come to be entertained the same way that someone might go to reading a novel. So you need to make sure that the plotting of your memoir matches the important plots, plot points that you would have in a novel. Lots of tension, lots of conflict, showing us what happened and keeping us on the edge of our seats to find out how you resolved that. Okay, so that is more a description that brings us into the experience, which is why I say it needs to be written in scenes. That is how you turn kind of a dull telling, I did this and then I did this and then I did this into a very exciting, I'm on the edge of my seat, is you plot it out scene by scene. This goes back to the first mistake. Obviously, if you have 
a million scenes in your book, a million stories, you're going to not know what scene to bring next. You have to be really clear. What is the theme that I am writing about and how do I carve that out of the scenes? You're going to leave a lot of your life on the cutting room floor. You need to talk to your friends and family and tell them it does not mean you don't love them, that they were not in your memoir. It just means that they didn't fit into the particular story that you were telling because you need to choose that one. Now here's my pro tip for how to write in scenes, just to start the, the flow of that. You can practice this today. Start writing in present tense, okay? So present tense is where instead of saying, I got in my car and I drove down the street and I picked up my kid from school, you say, I'm getting in my car. It's chilly, I wish I had my gloves, I didn't realize how cold it is outside. And honestly, I feel cold in my heart at the same time. As I pull out of my driveway, I notice that my neighbor is walking by, that guy who I'm always a little bit nervous about. He would have to show up later as being a bad guy, right? <laughs> um, and then I turn around and I see that my dog isn't in the back of my car. Oh no, I'm gonna be late picking up my kid from school. So do you see the difference between those two? One of them brings you in, you're gripped, you're on the edge of your seat. So it doesn't mean that you have to always be pointing out the negative. It's that you're trying to get that sense of urgency, that sense of, oh my gosh, I'm in this car right now. I am doing something that is very important to the overall story. So if you're telling people people about points in your story that are not important to the beginning, middle, end, where you as a protagonist are going, they're going to get bored and put the book down. You need to make sure that every single scene that you're carving is coming out of the story they need to hear. It's coming out of a, an interest in what they need to know. Okay. And so what I want to say again as that, as that tip is that if you start writing in present tense, you'll notice that it you have to bring in more description. It's not it's not enough to just say, um, I get in my car, I drive down the street, I pick up my kid from school. It's like, it's like, oh no, I want to give some sense of what it's like there. Use your senses, use your, um, the, the sounds that you're hearing or the smells or the feeling, like I said, the temperature, it's cold in the car, you know, whatever you need to do to bring that scene alive for us. So just try as an example, writing the scene in present tense and see what happens. So the third mistake I see memoir writers make is writing out of anger or spite. Because in a lot of cases, the reason we're writing is to heal something. And I talk about this a lot because what I work on most is transformational nonfiction. And that transformation happens both inside of ourselves and also for the reader who's reading it. But often that transformation needs to happen for us first. So in that mindset, you might be writing from anger. Anger is not a problem. Anger is energy. Anger needs to be expressed. And if your reader thinks you have um, a bone to pick with people throughout the entire book, they'll notice that the book is not about entertaining them. It's about you getting something, right? And readers are not altruistic. They don't want to read a book for you. They want to read a book for themselves. So you need to make sure that the anger that you need to express in the book, which you might, is not spiteful, hateful, like grinding that, you know, <laughs> that knife deeper into your ex-husband or whatever it might be, right? It's actually there because it helps bring alive the story and helps the reader understand more. And maybe they get in touch with their own anger in the process. So I love this quote. It was actually originally, I think, said by Nadia Bowles Weber, but it's most commonly repeated by Glennon Doyle, which is you need to write from the scar, not the wound, because the scar is healed. The scar has some perspective. The scar is no longer hot under the collar and wanting to get theirs. The scar wants to reveal honestly what happened. And if you don't know whether you're at that place yet, you're probably not there because it's a very clear distinction inside of yourself. You're going to write about it not to give him his or give her hers, but instead to provide the reader with some context for your own personal journey. So what's my tip for not writing from anger or spite? It is to write the book before the book. I talk about this a lot. So the book before the book doesn't need to be a full-length book. It's actually just a way of describing writing something for yourself where you're not yet even ready to think about what the reader needs. You need to write it for yourself. It's actually part of your healing process to get that anger out. Great. 
Go hate write. I love that. In fact, it can be one of those motivations that gets you writing more. I love that for you because I want you to get into the habit of writing. And when you are writing the book before the book, you're learning how to write every day, regardless of whether that actually sees the light of day. And I'll tell you what, some people think it's a waste of time to do that. It is a waste of time not to do that. Because if you spend your time writing a spiteful book <laughs> that readers are going to be turned off by, what's the point of putting the book out there? This process is first and foremost for you. Writing a memoir is first and foremost for you. Get that hate writing out. Get that healing writing out. Get any anger or spite or upset you have out, digested, integrated, and then step back and look at the big picture and see what parts of maybe that angry story you need to tell in order for the reader to truly understand your journey and leave in just what the reader needs. And in fact, if I could give you one tip overall for the number one best way to write a memoir, it's to leave in only what the reader needs to understand that one story. Not to understand who you are as a whole person. No one will ever be able to do that from a memoir. But they can understand who you were at the beginning, how you experienced this story, and who you were at the end. And those two things need to be different. Who you are at the beginning and who you are at the end, we need to see evolution in you. Okay? And evolution oftentimes along the theme of the book that you're writing. So my last pro tip for you in writing memoir is that I want you to be reading best-selling memoir. If you want your book to be read widely by people who don't know you, then you need to be reading what are people already excited about, what kinds of books are working. Not that your book will be exactly like them, but you'll learn, honestly, first and foremost, the level of professionalism of the writing that is required. You need to be writing a book where the pages are turning themselves. It is so exciting. And it might not be exciting in a way of like your life is exciting because sometimes it's a quiet story, but it's exciting in the way it's written. It's exciting in watching you change and grow. It's exciting for the reader because you've plotted it out well. And again, you haven't included every single thing in your entire life. So I want to talk to you about a few of my favorite memoirs. I'm going to start with two memoirs that are actually currently on the bestseller list as we speak. So the first one is called Crying in H Mart, and this is by Michelle Zahner. And this is a, a story of a woman who is surviving essentially her mother's death of cancer and how her own identity shifts in the process of her mom dying of cancer. So you can see, I mean, this is a woman who's actually um, was the, the in, in the band Japanese Breakfast. So she's probably got a ton of other stories that were not included in the book. The focus of the memoir is on that period of time when her mother was dying of cancer. Now there's obviously other stories that are going to get pulled in and that's great, but you want to choose that one story that you're going to focus your memoir on. The second book that's on the New York Times bestseller list as I'm writing this right now is Everything I Know About Love by Dolly Alderton. So this actually is being turned into a TV show, which is probably why it's on the bestseller list. But it's essentially the story of a young journalist and her sort of experience of, of love and dating in her 20s. So again, it's not that she doesn't include other stories. She does. But throughout the entire book, the through line is her dating experiences, what, what, how she learned and grew throughout her twenties in the relationships that she was in. Okay. So that is something you can do as well. You could choose, you know, your forties. There's a lot that comes up. I'm in my forties. I can tell you there's a lot that comes up in your forties. Maybe you choose a decade of your life with one particular theme that runs through it, but you're choosing something specific and you are focusing it and probably even more importantly, marketing the book based on that. When you read everything I know about love and you know that it's a book about dating, it's going to be of interest to a certain cohort of people. Not everybody. That never happens. You cannot find a book that is going to appeal to everyone. But this book knows its audience is something that we say in publishing. It knows its audience and it knows its audience because she chose something specific. So please do the same. A few classics that I love that I want to talk about that I also recommend you reading. The first one is Redefining Realness by Janet Mock. This is a story of a young boy discovering that he is actually a woman inside and over the course of the journey of becoming the woman that he is meant to be she is meant to be and now she lives as a woman and the I love this book especially because the book ends of the book the beginning of it you know that the thing that is getting her to start thinking back about her childhood is that she needs to tell the man that she's dating a new man that she started off life as a, as a boy and then at the end we find 
find out what happens. But in the middle, we see the story of how she became who she was. So what I love is that we see the childhood, but we see it in context of what's happening today. And I want you to go and read this book and see how she uses present tense and past tense because it's very creative and I really like it. Then I often talk about The Light of the World by Elizabeth Alexander. So this is the story of a happy marriage that unfortunately ends um, badly. You see at the beginning that her husband dies. And it's how she digests and integrates that, that particularly difficult trauma in her life. This is an important one because so many people that I am working with are writing stories of recovery after either they've had an illness or um, a, a husband or partner has died or a child has died. And this is a stunning example of what great writing can do to a story that kind of everybody has lived in some way or another. And it shows you that you can bring back the theme of just loss of a loved one, which seems kind of cliche, and you can make it fresh, original, and gorgeous. So I highly recommend checking that one out. The final book I'm going to mention is um, what I call the divorce memoir that launched a thousand ships. <laughs> so Eat, Pray, Love by Elizabeth Gilbert. So many of my clients are wanting to write a book like Eat, Pray, Love. And I bring it up for two reasons. Number one, because it really is readable like a novel. Like you cannot put this book down. And secondly, because it is a book that is one in a million. No other book is ever going to be Eat, Pray, Love. It was a very special publication. It, in a way, brought back the genre of memoir onto the bestseller list after it had a bit of a lull post-90s. Um, and I can tell you my story of this. I actually got an early publication edition, which is called an ARC. Um, and I got the ARC in my inbox at my office at Hyperion. And the, the cover itself just captured me. And I didn't have time to read a book for fun. I mean, I was reading books all day long for work. And I picked it up and I will tell you I have never been approached so many times on the subway asking what book I am reading okay people were like I love that cover what is that book never has happened before and what it says to me is that sometimes there is a book that is lit up <laughs> by some unseen force that we cannot quantify. And it is meant to be a major game changer. And that was Eat, Pray, Love. So while I encourage you to read it, to see how someone, a really beautiful craftswoman of writing can plot a memoir so that it reads like a novel, that's great. I also wanna say, don't write exactly the same book. <laughs> because it's not going to it's not going to happen again. This is a once in a lifetime thing. Um but there are ways you can write your own divorce story so that it is fresh and so that it reaches a particular audience that you're looking for. If it knows its audience and it's very specific, I think that divorce memoir still can work. But it needs to be thought through in a fresh way because this book is what we call the category killer, meaning there will never be another divorce memoir like Eat, Pray, Love. And of course, it's so much more than a divorce memoir. It's a, you know, exploration and a woman does it up. But that's, that's kind of what, what it was framed as when it came out because that appeals to so many people. So you can call your book a divorce memoir and see if, you know, get an appeal, but have it have something super original and different. Don't make it one of these three part books. It's not going to work again. Um, but you can really study the craft that she has in this book because she's really an amazing writer. All right, I hope this has been helpful. I want you to avoid the mistakes that I see memoir writers make, especially first time memoir writers, because if you do have a story to tell, there is someone out there who needs to hear it. So please let life come through you, relax, enjoy the writing, write the book before the book if that's what needs to happen now, and just know you're on the right path as long as you are writing. All right, my friends, enjoy uh, your writing process and I will see you in the next video. Thank you.